friend of the show, New York Times columnist David French. Welcome back to the news. Well, thanks, Matt, for having me. I, I always enjoy talking to you. Well, likewise, I tell you, I was very intrigued by this this recent column you had in the New York Times about why Haley voters should support Biden. Uh, I found it very interesting. And, and one thing that you don't overtly mention is that it used to be that conservatism was this three-legged stool, national yeah. security conservatives, social conservatives, and fiscal conservatives. And I think what you did in this column is basically go to each leg of the stool and argue right. that Biden is actually <laughs> better for conservatives than, than Trump. Is, am I right on that? Well, yes, but. Okay, so it, in ordinary circumstances, you would never in a million years say that Biden is any kind of fit for Reagan conservatives. Um, I, I made it clear in the, in the piece, there are lots of disagreements. Uh, I don't think that Reagan conservatives can find a home in any sense at all in a Biden-led Democratic Party. The question is, between two candidates, which one is a better fit? And what I wanted to do was to take on this issue, not from the standpoint of, although I did mention, of course, all the litany of Trump scandals, but also we know for a fact that people are simply not rejecting Donald Trump on that basis. Many, many people. It's just, you can say indictments, impeachments, affair. You can go through the whole litany of everything a hundred thousand times and people, they're just over it. Or some of them don't really know that much about it. And they want to know, well, where do people stand? Where, uh, what kind of policies, what kind of outcomes can we expect? And, and so from that standpoint, I thought it was worth making more of the positive case. But the positive case also still depends on a negative case, Matt, because it's depending on the reality that MAGA is moving away from Reagan conservatism. And if there's any momentum here, the direction is away. Whereas on the foreign policy front, which to me is the most important front of this election, aside from sort of the, you know, the underlying question about American democracy, but on the foreign policy front, Biden has, oddly enough, been moving towards the more Reagan view. And so it really does depend not on a case for Biden totally, but it really also depends on how the MAGA movement is trying to move on from Reagan conservatism. And if it continues to win, then MAGA will destroy Reagan conservatism. In many ways, the only way to salvage Reagan conservatism for the time being is defeating MAGA. I'm going to play a clip if I can get the technology to work. This is actually from the State of the Union, which seems like a million yeah. years ago, but it was just last week, right? Um, <laughs> what was it this week? Time is a flat circle. But Biden is attempting to kind of make this case that you're talking so long about. long ago, when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. <laughs> now... Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that? yeah, <laughs> he's he's right. I mean, now the quote that he's using, what Trump's he said, do whatever the hell you want if these NATO countries don't pay or don't pay up, um, which is an extraordinarily dangerous statement for a president of the United States to make. But this is exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when you go back to 2020, Russia had not invaded Ukraine. This extraordinary crisis, which I believe is the most important uh, confrontation issue in the world today, the most important issue in the world today, had not emerged in 2020. So in 2022, this enormously important issue emerges, and initially there was a lot of unanimity. Uh, there was a lot of consensus that Ukraine needed to be defended. I mean, it was Republican, Democratic, 
overwhelmingly. But then this is what I'm talking about when I say MAGA is sprinting away from Reagan conservatism. The true MAGA core never was on board with defending Ukraine because in MAGA lore, Ukraine is a villain. Remember, Mag in, in MAGA, sort of the MAGA extended conspiracy universe, Ukraine is this villain and you really blame the 2016 Russia interference on Ukraine. I mean, this was part of the basis for first impeachment is Trump thought that there was some mythical server in Ukraine. And so MAGA got to work within the Republican Party and begin has been alienating more and more and more, uh, you know, many, many more Republicans from the Ukrainian side to the point where Republican support for Ukraine is softest amongst Republicans. And so this is exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about the extinction of Reagan conservatism. The longer MAGA is the dominant faction, the more influence it has over rank and file Republicans and the more they yank them away from Reagan conservatism. And this is a departure so great that at the height of the Cold War, Matt, this would be an election ender. This yeah. would be a race ender. It would end the, the political career of anybody who was that weak. Uh, it would have ended it. You know, remember, it was sort of Jimmy Carter's perceived weakness in front of the Soviet Union and Jimmy's and sort of the actual reversals America experienced in the Carter administration. They were so profound and serious that Americans did not give the White House back to Democrats until after the Cold War. So that's how serious weakness is. And yet, and yet, um, it's considered to be out of bounds to say that that should be dispositive in the way that you view the election. Yeah, but we're the rhinos, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and I don't, I don't think this had happened when your column came out, but just in the past few days, we've learned that Viktor Orban said that Trump told him that if Trump gets reelected, Ukraine won't get another penny from the United States. Right. Which, again, is a catastrophe, because also since I wrote that column, what did Vladimir Putin do? Vladimir Putin said, why would I negotiate when they're running out of ammunition? <laughs> Which, if you're a Machiavellian like Vladimir Putin, of course, that's the answer. Wait, I'm going to negotiate for a ceasefire when I'm watching my forces advance, when I'm watching the Ukrainian military bleed dry and when I'm seeing less volume of fire incoming at me. I mean, so this is. This is the kind of stuff, Matt, you and I were both old enough to remember what the Republican Party would do with this in years past when there was democratic weakness facing the Soviet Union, or we perceived a democratic weakness in facing any of sort of our foreign foes. And now, right now, the number, the most weak link in the American chain in opposing a Russian aggression is Donald Trump, the standard bearer of the Republican Party. And that's not the only thing last week. We saw that, you know, full throated Donald Trump against the TikTok ban. So, yes. again, yeah. you have here something where our foreign, a foreign adversary has this sort of ability to turn out a fire hose of, of propaganda into American life. And Biden says, let's ban TikTok. Trump says, let's not. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, you feel like at some point, if you grew up in the 80s, that you just can't believe what you're seeing. I'm going to, I'll play the Trump TikTok. TikTok clip in a second. But, um, you know, it's crazy, right? We had this Chinese spy balloon that came over America and everyone freaked out. And we were like, yeah. shoot it down. Biden shoot, didn't shoot it down fast enough. Um, and yet hundreds of thousands of Americans have like a Chinese spy balloon in their pocket, effectively, <laughs> in the form of an app that we'd voluntarily give them our data. And yeah. voluntarily allow them to propagandize our, you know, our kids. Um, and it's like, well, what are you going to do? It's a good app. Well, and, and what are the reasons why Trump is opposing this? Well, so there's, of course, the, you know, the, the possibility that, you know, here he has about half a billion dollars in judgments against him and a uh, conservative, conservative or a, a mega billionaire donor, Republican donor is pouring millions into people who support TikTok. Um, is that a, a factor? But also what Trump has said, and this is the thing that really gets me, um, Matt, what Trump has said is the reason why he wants to ban, not ban TikTok, is that that would make Mark Zuckerberg or American companies that he doesn't like get yeah. stronger. And so this is very illustrative. For him, the real enemy is the internal enemy. It's the it is, enemy yeah. to him personally. 
And so the fact that Mark Zuckerberg might get stronger or the fact that, um, you know, the, the so-called deep state has connections with American tech means, no, we'll, we'll let the Chinese spy app continue to dominate the American market rather than maybe give Meta any more reach. It's a really remarkable, and again, reminds me of, I remember when Jean Kirkpatrick gave a speech at the 1984 Republican convention, and she talked about how they always blame America first. And, you know, one of the core arguments, again, of the traditional conservative movement was that especially the far left of the Democratic Party saw internal enemies as more consequential than, say, the Soviet Union. And and that America's actions were always more into blame than, say, Soviet actions. And, um, you know, that was maybe that was not true of mainstream Democrats. But, you know, the far left in the Cold War really, you know, people forget, uh, you know, people forget many of the dynamics of the Cold War. And here he is here. He is mimicking the kind of behavior that I would see from not just the mainstream of the Democrat, not the mainstream, the far left. And that internal enemy focus. And so yep. it's incredibly whether it's, disturbing. Whether it's blame America first or the politics of victimhood, today's Republican Party, the MAGA Trump Party, is the left that I hated. The, the whole reason I didn't sign <laughs> yes. up. Yes, I know. It's amazing. Big emphasis on state power and control, isolationist. I mean, you just walk through it now. The Trumpist movement would use state power and control differently than the far left would. But the view, the theory of state power is still very much in line with the far left. All right. Uh, let me just quickly play this TikTok. Uh, this is Trump from a few days ago on CNBC. Could have banned TikTok. I had it banned just about. I could have gotten it done. Uh, but I said, you know what? But I'll leave it up to you. I didn't push them too hard because, you know, let them do their own research and development. And they decided not to do it. But as you know, I was at a, the point where I could have gotten it done if I wanted to. Uh, I sort of said, you guys decide. You make that decision because it's a tough decision to make. Frankly, there are a lot of people on TikTok that love it. There are a lot of young kids on TikTok who, who will go crazy without it. There are a lot of... Uh, users, uh, there's, you know, a lot of good and there's a lot of bad with TikTok. But the thing I don't like is that without TikTok, you can make Facebook bigger. And I consider Facebook to be an enemy of the people, along with a lot of the media. That's exactly what you're saying, David. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Now, you know, there's a chance that the TikTok bill dies in the Senate and it won't necessarily be Trump's fault if you know, a lot of Democrats are now getting a little bit of cold feet because TikTok is so popular. You know, you're talking about an app that about what are 170 million Americans use. And so there's some politicians now are getting cold feet because it's so popular. But the reality, Matt, is the very popularity of it demonstrates the necessity of the yeah. legislation. So it will be interesting exactly to see. You're right. Once mm -hmm. you allow the Trojan horse in, you know, or whatever analogy, like the fact that they are now leveraging it and weaponizing it to pressure politicians and activate their users and content creators and all that is indicative of the problem. Yes, exactly. It's incredibly indicative of the problem. And think about this PR blunder. You know, here we are saying the real problem here is that TikTok, in addition to vacuuming up all of our personal data, which gets dangerous when you're just pulling all that personal data into really, you know, enemy hands, you know, it was a serious thing when China did its OPM, Office of Personnel Management, hack and got in the Obama era and got all of that personal information of federal employees and people who had security clearances, including mine, <laughs> by the way. Mm. Um, that's a big deal. Now they just get to do that by you downloading an app. And then the other thing they do is ultimately in the people in the People's Republic of China's hands is the ability to turn on a fire hose of propaganda, which it did in a very unwise way when the House was debating the bill. So TikTok pushes out, contact your representatives. Representatives are flooded in some cases with, you know, calls by crying middle schoolers. And it actually demonstrated the bill's proponent's point. Look what they can do. Look yeah. how they can immediately distort our public square. And so in that circumstance, you know, they demonstrated why 
the bill was necessary. And then here comes Trump. No, 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 no. Facebook is Facebook is the real enemy. All right. I want to get back to your column, uh, why Haley voters should support Biden. We've just talked about national security. I think pretty compelling case there. If you're a Reagan conservative, Biden, probably the better choice. Um, let's talk about you know the social conservatives, the yeah. second leg, let's say, of the uh, of the stool. Now, character, we're not going to talk about that. You've already addressed the fact that nobody cares. Yeah. Uh, even all the people who talked about <laughs> Bill Clinton don't mm -hmm. care about Trump's uh, personal behavior. The issue of abortion for a lot of us, though, David, is a litmus yeah. test. Um, but you make an interesting case. Now, look, Kamala Harris isn't doing you any yeah. favors. She was New. just in Minneapolis <laughs> touring an, an abortion clinic. That's, that was terrible. <laughs> yes, that but was terrible. You make the case, an interesting case, that this issue is a little more complicated than we might have thought a couple years ago. Yeah. So I will tell you, this is the hardest issue for me. I'm pro-life. I strongly disagree with the Democratic position uh, on abortion. Strongly disagree with it. I celebrated the end of Roe v. Wade, uh, believed that Dobbs was a properly reasoned decision, said so, wrote about it, tweeted about it, podcast, I've just broadcast that from the mountaintops. But also, the longer I have been pro-life, the more I've begun to see that, you know, when I first was pro-life, I was thought, our goal is to ban abortion, our goal is to ban abortion. The longer I got into it, the realize, more I realized that the goal is to end abortion. The, the, re, the real issue is the number of abortions. That, that is, we want fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer abortions. And that was actually the case, even when the Supreme Court was still protecting abortion rights from the beginning of the Reagan administration for the next 36, 37 years, the abortion rate trended downwards. It trended downwards under pro-life presidents. It trended downwards under pro-choice presidents to the point where, and it kept trending down. I mean, even under the Obama administration, eight years of a very pro-choice president, he left office with more than 300,000 fewer abortions. So Donald Trump comes in and from a legal standpoint, Yes, he absolutely nominated the justices who overturned Roe, and he deserves credit for that. I have said that and keep saying it. However, something changed in the United States of America regarding abortion in a dramatically negative way. And, and so in 2017, the abortion rate continued to go down, but then it went up in 2018, it went up in 2019, it went up in 2020 to the point where Trump then became the only president since Carter who saw a rise in the abortion rate. But that wasn't all, Matt. What ended up happening then is after Dobbs, all of a sudden the pro-life position starts to collapse electorally, even in red states. So Kentucky, Ohio, Montana, Kansas, there hasn't been a statewide referenda win for the pro-life movement. And here's what my real, con uh, here's a huge concern that I have. One, there's a degrading effect on our culture that Donald Trump has demonstrated that harms values that we care about, like abortion rates. And then number two, when the pro-life movement is in the hands of MAGA, it does terribly electorally. And if you're going to continue to vote for Trump and MAGA, you're continuing to put the pro-life movement in MAGA's hands. And I think that is terrible for the pro-life movement going forward. I just want to reiterate something significant that you noted, but didn't linger on. The, the number of abortions for the first time in decades increased under Trump, under Trump's tenure, during Trump's tenure. But this is not a backlash to Roe being overturned. No, it was before. This happened before. Before, Roe was yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, something, else, before. something else happened. And, you know, I've written about this. What if you look at under the Trump, in the Trump four years, the indicia of hope versus despair all turned in the despair direction. And, and so you look at marriage rate plunging during Trump. If you look at crime, which I'm sure we'll get to, he had the largest one year increase in murder rate in 40, 50 years, maybe ever. Um, if you look at deaths of despair, he left office with more deaths of despair. It was he presided over in many ways a crumbling of the American spirit. 
and it that has radiating effects throughout the culture. And so, you know, one of the things that we want when we're talking about a a, a presidential candidate is we want to not just hear what their policies are, but if they actually have a record in office, we want to look at the, what their record is. And so if you say, I'm going to, let's go back to crime, fix American carnage, which was his vow in his inaugural address, we can ask ourselves, did he fix American carnage? Uh, and the answer is he definitely did not. There was more carnage when he left office than when he arrived. Yeah. And so that's the thing I would ask my conservative friends to examine is he's got a record. Yeah. We know, but, but you know, we, a, a lot of it, David, um, I have mm -hmm. a column out right now. It just came out right before we were recording oh, nice. uh, at the Daily Beast. And Donald Trump is trying to run on saying, uh, I was president from 2017 to 2019. He wants to keep 2020 out of the picture, right? Because yeah. that's the COVID year. It doesn't count. And the point I make is, number one, even if you look at the data not counting 2020, his record is not very good in many ways. The unemployment rate was low, but yeah. it's low now too. Yeah. Um, right. But there's a lot of bad things that happened even before 2020. I also don't think it's fair to exclude 2020. No. For reasons I get into in the column. But that but I think that's but I think that's why um conservatives give him a pass on this. They 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 don't want to look at his record because they say, well, he was doing awesome until COVID ruined the greatest economy the world has ever known. Well, you know, the one of the answers to that is look, do we not elect president. Do we not historically tend to judge presidents, especially um, the presidents of historical prominence, by how they handle a crisis? Isn't, don't you, you don't say, you know, when we're looking back at FDR, what, what dominates the record of FDR is, uh, well, he was elected in the middle of a crisis, but let's suppose, uh, you know, things that were aren't being more, were being worked out a bit more, but after December 7th, 1941, is when FDR really defined his legacy. It was in the middle of that ultimate existential crisis. 1861, Lincoln defines his legacy in crisis. Yeah. Presidents define by rising to the occasion or falling when there's a crisis. You know, why is it that um, America wanted to move on from Jimmy Carter in 1980? They felt like he did not rise to the occasion of the crises that he faced. It's the weirdest thing in the world that Republicans look at Trump in the many things that we can point to in 2020 where he just absolutely fumbled the ball and say, well, that was COVID. Well, no, that's when it was more important that he not fumble. <laughs> that's, it's, getting, it's getting the whole analysis of it backwards. Yeah, no, great minds think alike, David, because yeah. that is <laughs> in the column. And uh, look, that's, that's why... People like us worry about, like, is this a person of character? Does this person have experience? Is this person competent? Is this person going to unify Americans? Because anybody, I, I, I write in the column, like, if it's a sunny day and there's no turbulence, pretty much any certified pilot could land you safely in Atlanta, right? But what happens when there's storms and there's turbulence, yeah. right? Yeah. Then you need an experienced, competent a competent pilot who probably wasn't out drinking the night before or whatever. And um, Trump, during the best of the sunniest of days, was was yeah. tipping over, you know, liquor carts and drink carts on the plane with the turb. He was injecting turbulence into what should have been a smooth ride. Yeah. Um, anyway, weird yeah, metaphor, exactly. but you get it. No, ex I mean, exactly. You know, you could go back to January, February, March, April 2020 and just it would be, you'd be gobsmacked to read all of the false things that he was saying. And we know that he knew some of them were false. He was deliberately saying false things to the American people about a deadly pandemic. And that's not held against him, which is remarkable. Again, Matt, it's yeah. remarkable. Well, and it, it is interesting. Honestly, if I weren't writing about this stuff, I probably wouldn't even know it. I mean, yeah. Biden has done a bad job of selling his presidency. Oh, these yeah, narratives, sure. these false narratives. Like, I thought 
if you watch the news, and by the way, I live close to Washington, D.C., so D.C. actually does have bad crime right now, especially yeah. property crime. But it's Oh, yeah, D.C. But, does has a real problem. If you watch the news, you would assume that like violent crime is is very high. Actually, in 2020, it was very high when Trump yep. was president. And now it's actually pretty low. It's come down like it's 15%. A it's a 50-year low for violent crime right now, a 5-0, 50-year low for violent crime. And we just had the largest one-year drop in the murder rate in American cities, again, for decades, perhaps ever. And so, um, you know, so when you're talking many, about- I don't think people know this. No, I, they definitely don't know it. That, that's what, we, Matt, you're hitting on something that we run up against in this election, which is, number one, Believe it or not, a lot of people don't know, especially Republicans don't know about Trump scandals. Republicans. Now, Democrats, of course, know chapter and verse and then some, but um, Republicans don't know Trump scandals. And also Americans don't know Biden's accomplishments. And part of me wonders this. Can I just engage in some rank Please. speculation? Bring it. OK, so I would say if I, from my standpoint, the Biden's best point, it, best three points are strongest against our foreign adversaries, lower, um, a strong economy with lower deficits than Trump, and more law and order. That's a traditional Republican pitch. Stronger economy, stronger posture to our adversaries, and law and order. That's not typically your pitch to the left side of the aisle as much. And so I just don't know how much they're attuned to making that as like a core theme of a Democratic election um, is that because all of those things, all of those themes sort of ping Republican policy centers, you know, they, they sort of ping those centers of your brain that are, are more Republican attuned traditionally, historically. And so, you know, I have begun to see Biden's allies pick up on this, though. They're starting to say, wait, whoa, every American should we know we, we just hit a 50 year low in the crime rate. Right? You know, every American yeah. should know it's lower deficits than Trump. You know, every American should know we're stronger against our foreign adversaries under Biden. And you mentioned spending. I mean, that's the third leg is fiscal conservatism. Yeah. And um, although Biden, like every president spends too much, every modern oh, yeah. president, certainly. There's no fiscal conservative in this race. But Trump, even if you don't count COVID spending, which I think we yeah. should. Yeah, we maybe, should. It's understandable, but but yeah. it, we should it's factor it in. It's still money. But even yeah. before COVID, Trump was spending money like a drunken sailor. And he, yes. Yeah. The deficit went up every year of his presidency, not the debt. Of course, the debt goes up every year when you have any deficit, but the deficit, the annual spending gap went up every year of his presidency, even during peace and prosperity. So even when we had minimal military commitments abroad, say compared to the Trump or Obama, I mean, the Bush and Obama administrations, even when the economy is growing, both of those are normally formulas for reduced deficits. Trump spent so freely, we had a deficit higher every single year of his presidency. And so again, you know, if you're get that Reagan conservative, you, uh, many of them just haven't realized how much that Trump has sprinted away from you. So you don't say in this piece overtly, I mean, the headline is why Haley voters should support Biden. Yeah. You don't say in this piece overtly that you are voting for Biden or that you think conservatives or Republicans should vote for Biden. But I think based on our conversation and based on reading it, it seems like that's probably the case. Yeah, for me, that that's the case. I, you know, when it comes to opposing Trump, I actually, I think the soundest approach publicly is the one taken by, um, there's this group, you know, I'm, you know it, but I don't know if many of your listeners do, Republican Voters Against Trump. Um, Sarah Longwell is involved in this and some of the folks at the Bulwark. And they have a different approach than some of the folks you might see sort of in the larger anti-Trump world where they say, you have to support Joe Biden. That's what you have to do. Uh, Republican Voters Against Trump just says, don't vote for Trump. Like, don't, yeah. don't you can vote for Biden uh, or or a third party or but just don't vote for Donald Trump. And the core of my argument to Reagan conservatives is don't vote for Donald Trump. But I also believe they can in good conscience vote for Joe Biden 
because the policy, it is not 2020 anymore. It's not 2016. It's not 2020. People have moved in response to events. And time after time, Trump has yeah. moved away from Reagan conservatism and Biden has reacted to events by moving in ways that should please us. I mean, as Reagan said, I didn't leave the party. The party left me. Exactly. It seems like that drift is happening. I would say, though, and this goes to Republican voters against Trump, the people who are the best messengers are Republicans. Yes. yes. And so if you leave the party, in a sense, you're leaving uh, your credibility to talk to <laughs> these voters. So it's, it's, it's a catch-22, I would say. Well, you know, the interesting thing is if, whether or not you leave the party for MAGA is irrelevant. Um, so if you're opposed to Trump, in their view, you've left the party, a even if you keep an R by, and in fact, may even be more mad at you <laughs> if you keep yes. the R by your name. So the definition of Republican to MAGA is supporting Trump or not supporting Trump. Um, I consider myself a conservative independent because I, I, I want to, I believe that it is a very sound thing, especially for a journalist to shed formal partisanship, um, because I do think when you have a, uh, when you identify yourself formally with a party, it is very hard to disentangle yourself from that identity. Um, and so for me, I think it's very important for me to be an independent, um, but I'm definitely conservative. That's why I call myself a conservative independent. Um, and so I don't think there's any magic person who really can get through. We're eight years into this. I think that each person in their pl in their place in this culture and in their place in their communities, I think ha should be opposing Trump as persuasively as they can, meeting people where they are and trying to and to try to persuade people where they are. And that means Republican voters against Trump. That means independent voters against Trump. And it, of course, means Democrats. Uh, what has the feedback been like for this column? Has there been a lot of pushback? Honestly, I, I have to say that I thought from my standpoint, I would have thought this would have been more controversial. I've not seen a lot of controversy. Now, it may mm -hmm. be that they've already written people like you and me off. Um, yeah. Have you gotten the hate tweets and all that? Well, you know, I'm not I don't post on Twitter anymore. And the New York Times doesn't post on Twitter nearly as much. And it really is amazing that when you don't do that, um, you, you, the Twitter conversation gets extremely muted, but I still trended on Twitter that week. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and it was vitriolic. It was vitriolic, but there were two columns that I wrote last week, one about the 14th amendment decision, which I strongly disagreed with. And then the other one was about the Biden, uh, you know, Biden versus Trump. But the, the response was extremely vitriolic. Um, more vitriolic than I expected because I thought this would not be of real news to anybody that I would take this position, given the arguments I've made about Ukraine, given the arguments I've made about all of these issues that I, I've walked through and addressed. But yeah, it's extremely vitriolic. And I think the reason why the dynamic right now in MAGA is not to try to persuade, it's to bully. So we win a primary and then we bully our opponents into line. And so that, that's, the, that's the pattern. Um, and so it's not unusual to see them trying to bully people out of considering the argument. And so what you saw was just a bunch of people saying things about the piece that were completely false, that were, you know, um, I, yeah, it was just that bullying pattern. I can understand and I respect thoughtful disagreement. Let's have that conversation. I, I, you know, I don't think it's self-evidently true that every conservative, that my position is so self-evidently true that conservatives in good conscience can't disagree with me. Let's have that conversation. But that kind of conversation was not occurring. It was all the typical rhino, weak, vi vichy, you know, collaborator with the enemy, all of that nonsense. Well, I loved it. It brought up a lot of things I've been thinking about. So I think this made for a great conversation. Before I get you out of here, since we've been very good to Joe Biden today, <laughs> um, I want to end with something else he said at the State of the Union. Again, I know it seems like a million years ago. Yeah. But 
This is something he said that troubles me because if he goes through with it, I think it could go south. I'm going to play this clip for you, and I'd love to get your response on the other end. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable and humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more something more enduring. The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. Seems like a well-meaning idea. Um, I'm sure he's got domestic political pressure to do something like this. Seems like this could this could go wrong, though. And uh, yeah, what do you think? I, I, I'm less concerned uh, about an attack on the pier um, than maybe some folks. I think it's dangerous. Let me let me just say this. It's dangerous, but we can we can take measures to control or limit that danger. It is still dangerous. There's no question about that. I don't have maybe, maybe perhaps as much alarm, but that's a statement that could age very poorly. Um, so I would say I am not as concerned about the physical danger of it as some folks, but I, but I think it's dangerous, and I'm not sure how effective it'll be. It, I, uh, so if that is not, unless, unless he is receiving, and of, of course he has vastly more information about what's happening than I do, it is very difficult for me to see how, just as a matter of, of reality, that can make a material difference in the suffering of Gazan civilians without exposing some of our own folks to unacceptable risks. Um, that's my concern about it. So, yeah, yeah I, I would, you know, and look, Matt, we could have a whole podcast on stuff I've disagreed with Biden about. I mean, including I have some real concerns with some of the slowness of his responses in Ukraine, for example. Um, when I talk about Biden responding to China, to Russia, and to Hamas, my general view is he's been directionally correct in all of his responses, but I have lots of quibbles with the details. So this is not, um, you know, th there. That's why I say very clearly in the column: there, you don't have a home in a Biden Democratic Party, but you sure as heck don't have a home in MAGA. All right, my friend. Great conversation. I think that's a good place to leave it. Um, David French, anything you, you want to plug? Oh, not nothing, nothing really to plug. Although I will say um, I've seen Dune Part Two twice now in IMAX, <laughs> and I'm going to go see it again <laughs> before it leaves IMAX. So I'm not going to plug my work. I'll just go ahead and be one of the millions of people plugging Dune Part Two. Top five movie ever, Matt. Top five ever. Totally nerd out. Go see, see Dune 2. <laughs> David French, thank you for coming back on the news.